A recent article on safer drug supply has raised questions about its actual effectiveness. The BC Center for Disease Control boasts a substantial 55 to 91 percent reduction in deaths with safer opioids, but some, including columnist Adam Zivo, are not convinced. He's highlighted that the study might have overlooked crucial details, like what other medications people were using at the time, and went so far as to say that researchers cherry pick data to create a misleading impression that safe supply is more effective than it might be. Joining us now to unpack this further is columnist Adam Zivo. Adam, thank you very much for joining us on Forum Daily. Thank you for having me yet again. So the BCDC researchers, they, they've claimed that safe supply drugs have reduced the likelihood of death anywhere between 55 to 91 percent. That depends on how long people were on safe supply. What did they get wrong? And how or whom did you consult to come to that conclusion? Well, there's two errors that they made in the research. Uh, and I consulted with seven addiction physicians plus a scientist who has a background in stats analysis to discover this. So the first thing is that uh, they failed to fully account for the fact that half of the people who received safer supply also received medications like methadone and suboxone, which is known as ap- opi- which is known as opioid agonist therapy or OAT. Mm-hmm. So OAT medications are proven to reduce mortality in drug users. So of course, it'd be important to ask yourself, uh, are the mortality reductions that you're seeing being caused by OAT or by safer supply if you know many people are receiving both? Uh, though the researchers made some attempt to filter out the, the effects of oats, there were obvious and conspicuous gaps in their research. For example, they didn't, uh, look into the dosing of oat that people were receiving, even though safer supply patients tend to receive much more oat than others. And that has a meaningful impact on mortality. Now, when we dug into the data, we realized that there was a subpopulation in the study of people who had not received oats in the pre- preceding 30 days. Uh, And they're the ones where you would see the least amount of this confounding factor. And for that population, there seemed to be no statistically significant benefit to safer supply. There were no mortality reductions, which suggests that any mortality reductions that we saw in the study were driven by OAT and not by safer supply. So that's number one. Mm -hmm. Uh, The second thing is that they looked at uh, mortality reductions after only one week. And that's really strange. Imagine, for example, you were investigating a new insulin and you said, well, if you take the new insulin, you're fine after the, for a week afterwards, but you don't actually look at the effect over the course of a month or a year. And when we dug into the data, we found out that there were actually no mortality reductions after one year, which suggests that any mortality reductions that we saw after a week, even if they existed, disappeared in the long term. So what you challenged the authors of the BCDC on these gaps. What was their response to you? Uh, they tried to explain the gaps in the research and their explanations were woefully insufficient. For example, when I mentioned that it seemed that safer supply actually had no statistically significant effect, the lead researcher said, well, that doesn't mean that there's no effect at all. And that is technically true. So statistical significance has a very specific meaning. It means mm-hmm. that the, we, if something is statistically significant, we know that it didn't happen by chance. Essentially, there is less than a 5% chance that this was a fluke. Uh, and sometimes there are very weak effects that are missed by this. Uh, so this guy was essentially asking us to lower our evidentiary standards. So to, dis, you know, to basically abandon our norms that we usually use for statistical analysis and say, well, there might be some effect. But I think that debate kind of missed the point because he was claiming massive effects, 55 to 91% reductions in mortality. And now he was debating about statistical significance uh, while failing to acknowledge the fact that the effect was so small, we could ba- barely prove that it actually existed. And, and is it fair to say that that 55 to 91% and the media coverage of that is in part driving the policy discussion? Because obviously there would be a huge variation in terms of how policymakers approach the issue of drug overdoses dependent on the accuracy of this data and whether or not that 55 to 91 percent is in fact accurate. Well, the thing is that it has been cited quite a bit recently and it has impacted the discussion. So, for example, the Toronto Star wrote an editorial op-ed where they argued that safer supply should not be defunded. And they cited that study as one of their main examples of success, which I think is journalistic malpractice, right? You need to 
treat your evidence with a bit more skepticism. And similarly, the BC government announced that they were going to expand safer supply last Friday, mm -hmm. uh, even though simultaneously announced that they had discovered that the black market resale of these drugs was a common occurrence and causing, quote unquote. We'll be right back with Adam Zebo. We're back on Forum Daily with Adam Zevo talking about the research behind safe supply. Adam, before the break, you mentioned diversion, and I, and I want to touch on some tactics to help solve that problem. But I want to go back to opioid agonist therapy. Based on what you've said, it would appear that that could be a real game changer here in terms of saving lives. Why does it feel like there's an aversion to oat in the overall harm reduction conversation? Well, so opioid agonist therapy has been used for decades to treat addiction, and it is considered the gold standard in this space. Mm -hmm. However, the nature of the drug supply has changed recently. So it used to be that people were just using heroin, and now more recently they've started to use fentanyl. And fentanyl is 10 to 50 times stronger than heroin, and that's a problem because that creates very high drug tolerances. Now, oat medications are essentially very weak, long-acting opioids. So they manage people's withdrawals without getting them high. And it, 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 they help basically transition people to sobriety and people get titrated off of it slowly. Uh, but when someone's coming with a really high tolerance, it's more difficult to get them to the right level of oats for them to feel comfortable. So uh, there have been some difficulties for getting people onto oats. So the, the, the treatment is considered less effective for fentanyl users. Mm -hmm. However, harm reduction activists have said that oat basically is now useless in many cases, and that is not supported by evidence. Okay, so you mentioned that transition to sobriety. You've highlighted that over time, safe supply, for safe supply, there doesn't appear to be a difference in mortality rates. In your view, is that because of a failure to actually treat or address addiction? And what treatment interventions help actually get those addicts to sobriety because I, I mean that would i would assume that that would be beyond saving lives that would be the whole point of any intervention to prevent someone from potentially overdosing well safer supply activists they claim that safer supply is recovery oriented and that that it's supposed to keep people alive until they're ready to seek recovery but the problem is that in practice these programs are not this way uh, oftentimes they have no exit strategy, they have no recovery oriented goal, and they just uh, indefinitely provide people with drugs, which then just entrenches their addiction. Mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier that was that there was that report by the BC government that was published last Friday, and they had consulted widely with clinicians throughout the province and clinicians expressed moral distress by the fact that there was no exit strategy. And many times they just saw their patients develop ever higher drug tolerances which led them to wonder whether they were actually just contributing to the problem. Uh, in terms of how we can stop addiction, I think the most effective way is to use uh, newer forms of oat medications. For example, there's a drug called Sublocade, which is essentially an injectable drug. You take it once a month, it creates a repository in your body that slowly releases over a month, and it essentially functions as a vaccine against opioid use. You no longer get high from opioids. And if you have the proper dosing, you can't overdose anymore. That's a very interesting development in terms of other treatments. Um, on the issue of diversion, because I don't want to forget that, that's something we've talked about before. What are some of the key aspects here in terms of preventing diversion into the black market? What can the government do if these safe supply programs are going to exist to ensure that these drugs aren't ending up in the hands of people who shouldn't have them? being sold on the black market, or worst case scenario, ending up in the hands of children? Well, I mean, the simplest way to do that would be to mandate supervised consumption. Uh, if you did that, the diversion issue would evaporate right away. But unfortunately, safer supply activists and their allies in the government think that this is paternalistic, that this will dissuade people from using safer supply. And sure, maybe some drug users won't want to use safer supply if they have to come into a pharmacy or a clinic every few hours or every day to get to use their medication mm -hmm. or to use their free drugs, rather. Uh, but we have to look at the costs and benefits. Yes, that's a small cost uh, that some people will not want to use the program anymore. But the benefit is that we keep communities and children safe from diverted drugs. 
Now, we know that the safe supply funding is set to expire in March. Where do you see both the debate and the funding decisions going from here? We have about 40 seconds before the break. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, the Federal Minister of Addictions and Mental Health, Yara Sachs, confirmed in a hearing on Friday that she fully intends to continue funding for safer supply, regardless of the community harm. So this conversation is going to continue for a while. Adam, really appreciate you taking the time today. Thanks for sitting down with us. Uh, thanks for having me.